is my great pleasure to introduce Susan Binker, the presenter of this year's ISIR Holden Memorial Address. So I'd just like to say a few words about Susan, although there's a lot to say about her. So Susan is a developmental psychologist, journalist, and a broadcaster. She was educated at McGill University and the University of Waterloo, after which she spent 25 years in clinical practice and teaching psychology. The newspaper columns, Problem Solving and the Business Brain on the Neuroscience and Behavioral Economics of Business World appeared weekly in Canada's national newspapers, The Globe and Mail. Susan's ideas are frequently featured in the media, including the New York Times, the Times of London, The Economist, The Financial Times, The Today Show, Oprah Magazine, and Der Spiegel, among other publications. Her radio columns currently air monthly on CBC. Susan also writes opinions and feature articles on psychology, public policy, education, and business for international press. Her book about roots of sex differences in the classroom and workplace, The Sexual Paradox, Men, Women, and the Real Gender Gap, was awarded the William James Book Award by the American Psychological Association in 2009 and has been published in 17 countries. Her writing has been recognized in numerous awards. Her book, The Village Effect, is currently on the non-fiction bestseller list in Canada, where she lives. The book explores how face-to-face -face contact is crucial for learning, happiness, resilience, and longevity. To sum up, Susan is an outstanding science communicator, and we are honored to have her present her talk, The Elephant in the Room, talking about individual differences to the press. We're very happy to have you here, Susan. Well, thank you, Julia, for that beautiful <coughs> introduction. And thank you to the organizers of this event, Alyosha, David, and the members of the Holden Committee. Um, and the incredible honor of receiving this award, named for the late, great Constance Holder, known by many as Tansy. Uh, a few words about Constance Holder before I start the presentation in earnest. Um, Constance Holder was, uh, worked as a journalist for a science magazine, and she was killed by um, a five-ton truck that hit her from behind while she was on her bike. And she was 68 years old at the time. It was a terrible tragedy. And what David Lubinsky didn't know when he asked me to give this address in uh, April, last April, and I didn't know it either, was that I too would be hit by a truck. That was about three months ago on September 9th, just as my new book was coming out. And um, I just thought, well, what are the odds of two journalists specializing in behavioral science getting hit by a truck while they're standing on the sidewalk. Um, it gives a kind of new and chilling meaning to the title of the column that Tansy wrote for Science, which was called Random Samples. <laughs> and certainly after Terry and Absalom's talk yesterday, I, was say, I must say I was really relieved that the Pareto principle doesn't hold for accident victims because 20% of women account for only 50% of accident claims. But for a few, that was a relief, because for a moment I got a whiff of what it feels like to be in a high-risk category, and it actually doesn't feel very good. Um, a little bit more about Constance Wilder. Um, she was a tremendous science communicator, speaking of science communication. She worked for 40 years for science, and um, Beautiful writing, crystal clear, also an editor, very incisive, very witty, outspoken, and irreverent, um, very highly respected, despite the fact that she was never afraid to report on hot topics. So that's why I chose this topic to talk to you about today, because I think it really um, respects uh, the memory of her life's work. 
And she was also a polymath and a gifted painter and pianist and synthesizer of ideas. And that's why I put this as the opening slide. This is a self-portrait of Tansy. She uh, painted herself. And it was hanging in the offices of science. Now, the title of this talk is The Elephant in the Room. And this is an expression, for those of you who don't understand it, of something everybody knows about but doesn't want to acknowledge. And really, the question I'm asking today in this talk is, how do we talk about what's true but is also taboo? And first, let's talk about what is taboo? What makes for a taboo? Let's look for, I mean, some of you know this already because you've had the experience of speaking to the press and speaking to the public. But as you know, individual and group differences are taboo, but in particular, sex, race, and genetics, and their impact on intelligence, achievement, and success. So that pretty much probably accounts for most of what you know, the people do in this room. Why? Why are these hot? Well, one reason is because, and, and this is something I'm going to come back to, that's why I opened a little bit with my own story, is that the narrative or the story is much more powerful to the human brain than data is. And there is a, a new book out, well, it's about uh, two years old now, by Jonathan Gottschall, and it's essentially about the evolutionary science of the story. And I'm just going to read you a little uh, excerpt from it. Let's see. Oh, I can find it. Here we go. It's called The Storytelling Animal, How Stories Make Us Human. And I'll read this for you. Tens of thousands of years ago, when the human mind was young, and our numbers were few, we were telling stories. And now, tens of thousands of years later, when our species teams across the globe, most of us still cue strongly to myths about the origins of things, and we still fail to an astonishing multitude of fictions on pages, <coughs> on stages, and on screens. Murder, sex, war, conspiracy, true stories, and false. We are, as a species, addict addicted to story, a set of brain circuits, usually brilliant, sometimes buffoonish, force narrative structure on the chaos of, chaos of our lives. And this is an underlying theme of what I want to talk to you about today, which is that the story is going to be much more powerful than the data. And unless you make your data into a story, you're going to have huge obstacles. So let's go back to the story. We know it's persuasive. A great story trumps scientific findings. It has huge emotive power. It makes, a good story makes people feel things. And the wisdom of crowds often triumphs over statistical thinking, which uh, some of you, but not everybody knows, is it doesn't come naturally to everybody. And also because of historical abuses of knowledge. Um, I don't have to tell you that there was discrimination of all kinds and that it was a huge fight legislatively and culturally to try to change and move things around. And I think the memory of that is still having an impact on people's stories. Now, a story about how a story comes science. So I'm going to tell you another story about myself. I think in 2010, um, I was invited by the German government to talk about sex differences to a conference. And that's when I had a really interesting experience about talking about unpopular ideas. Um, I essentially was telling the story in a, in a presentation about increased male variability. And you will all be familiar with this. Say, I was saying things like this. Well, you know, very small differences between the averages can mean very large differences of the extremes. There we go. I was making it very graphic. And I made it even more graphic talking about height because height is not as threatening to people as human behavior or intelligence. And, and I, I'm sorry these are not uh, in uh, European measures, but I was talking about how the male to female ratio at 5 foot 10 is 30 to 1. And at 6 feet, which is not much taller, it's 2,000 to 1. And of course, as you move along the tail, 
then you get somebody who is 8 feet 11 inches tall like this fellow here. There are no women who are 8 feet 11 inches tall. Okay? But what happened to me was when I spoke to this group, because I wasn't aware of their background, um, everybody listened quietly, and then at the, at the question period, the Q&A, um, that's when I discovered I had violated a sacred cow by discussing increased male variability. And during the Q&A, somebody stood up and said, how can we believe any of the science you presented when we all know here that science is dominated by men and has been corrupted by the patriarchy? <laughs> well, you laugh, but when that question was asked, 500 people stood up, clapped, and gave a standing ovation. <laughs> and that's when I knew I was in trouble. <laughs> so essentially, my mistake here was I didn't do my homework on the audience I was speaking to. So it was a very, I would say, formative experience for me, and now I never go into speak to a group or give them an interview before I find out who I'm talking to. Um, and that's one of the lessons I'm going to impart to you today. I mean, had I known that this was their background, of course I would have phoned out a little bit more on where this kind of idea was coming from. I certainly knew about the patriarchy, but I think I could have known a little bit more. <coughs> So let's talk a little bit about what makes a sacred cow. I'm just going to pause to take a little break right here. <clears throat> and I hope you're generating your own ideas as I ask this question. Where does righteous indignation come from? Well, since we had a very illustrious, in fact, two illustrious scientists here, or more from Scotland, I'm going to start with David Hume um, and read to you about an inquiry concerning the principles of morals, which he wrote in the late 1700s. Morality is nothing in the abstract nature of things, but is entirely relative to the sentiment or mental taste of each particular being, in the same manner as the distinctions of sweet and bitter, hot and cold, arise from a particular feeling of each sense or organ. Moral perceptions, therefore, ought not to be classed with the operations of understanding, but with the tastes or sentiments. And so David Hume compared our moral sense to the taste receptors on our tongue. And Jonathan Haidt, in our day, has taken this up and has tested this idea empirically. And, and in The Righteous Mind, his last book, he writes, intuition is the driving moral force of our lives. Reasoning comes later. So all of you um, here who wonder, how is it that people can object to my data? It's just data. <coughs> You're appealing to their sense of reason when, in fact, they're reacting to your data first through intuition. And that's a very important thing to keep in mind. Um, so. Another elephant in the room, John Haidt says that gut reactions or intuitions or feelings are the elephant that drive our moral sense or sense of righteousness. And rational thinking is this little driver, rider on the top. So this is rational thinking, and as you know, according to John Haidt, and this is really what's driving our moral sense. And um, so when people react to your work in a negative way, and they judge your work in a negative way, it's because in relation to their emotions of what you're doing, I mean, look at the size difference here. I mean, your feelings really sway things. So what makes a topic your sacred cow? Because we all have biases and we all have strong feelings about morality. So I'm going to um, read you some scenarios and I want you to pay attention to what happens to your body as I read these to you and how you feel about these things. These are scenarios that John Haidt used in um, his research to test people's sense, moral sense. So check your visceral response to these triggers. And check your feelings, <coughs> is there any harm done to anybody? Um, how do you feel? 
did the, do you feel that the people in the story I'm going to read to you violated a taboo? Okay. So here's the first story. A family's dog, can you hear me when I move away from the mic? Can you all hear the back? A family's dog was killed by a car in front of their house. They were hungry and they had heard that dog meat was delicious. So they cut off the dog's body and cooked it and ate it for dinner. <laughs> Nobody saw them do this. Okay, so check how you feel about this. Here's the next one. Deborah and Mark, a mother and son, are traveling, <clears throat> are traveling to France on Mark's college spring break. One night, they are staying alone in a beach house. They decide it would be interesting and fun if they tried having sex. At the very least, it would be a new experience. Deborah is using birth control pills and Mark uses a condom too, just to be safe. They both enjoy it, but decide not to do it again. They keep that night as a special secret between them, which makes them feel even closer to each other than they did before. No one else knows, and no one was hurt. Was it wrong? Here's another one. A family found that their heat was cut off during the winter because they could not pay their fuel bill. So they gathered wood in the park to make a fire and used the American, substitute your nationalities, flag, hanging on their front porch as kids. <laughs> okay, now this one requires actually a little prop. What's your name? Elizabeth, so you're going to be like a... a <laughs> 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 you want to take some Okay, so Elizabeth, you can have a sip. Have a set of shoes and relax. Yeah. Okay. So what I have in this bag here is a sterilized cockroach. And, and I'm going to kind of just tell you that this is a very clean cockroach. I, 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 it was raised in a clean environment. And just to make sure, I sterilized it in an autoclave so that there would be no germs on it. And now I'm going to dip this cockroach into Elizabeth's drink. And I'm going to wave it around a little bit. Would you like to take a sip? <laughs> no? Well, uh, should I show you the cockroach? Here, here it is. Uh, you know, it's very, very hard to find a cockroach in grass. And the best I could find was a dung beetle. <laughs> How about a dung beetle? No? Leave it comes to the so, one of the morals of this story, the general moral of this story, is that people have gut feelings, particularly about disgust and disrespect. And these feelings are what drive their moral judgment. Reason comes after the fact. Their reason is like a post hoc activity. And we'll get Rich Hyatt to tell us in what part of the brain these happen later. Um, so essentially, when people are critical of your work, remember how you felt about the cockroach or dung beetle. Now, if your visceral response to these values, it, it varies by background. So some people feel stronger about violations of sanctity or violations of you know, respect for their country, and some people feel stronger about unfairness. But essentially, aversion to certain values is universal. And one of these values is care versus harm or suffering. In other words, if you see somebody suffering, whether it's somebody related to you or not, and if you feel something, that's kind of a, a natural response to whether care is involved. For example, I think John Haidt's scenario about care is, you know, your son has appendicitis and he's rushed to the hospital and brought into the operating theater. And as they, you know, you're invited to watch. And you have to stand there and watch while they plunge the knife into his ab abdomen. If you have a recoil to that idea, right, because, you know, they're saving your son. So rationally, you should feel that this is a great thing. But actually, most of us viscerally feel like we don't want to watch this because the mechanism of care is elicited or provoked by that situation. 
Fairness versus injustice is another value. <coughs> Loyalty versus betrayal is another kind of, I, I, I hesitate to use the word innate, but maybe you wouldn't object. But it's something that's common pretty much in various degrees in all cultures. Authority versus subversion, much more common in non-Western cultures as a supreme value. Sanctity and purity versus degradation or disgust. Here I listed that with the cockroach. Okay? And liberty versus constraint. So what's interesting about this list is in Western cultures, what's really important to people is three values, care, fairness, and liberty. A little bit of sanctity, purity, but not as much in other cultures. But in other cultures, for example, loyalty and authority are really, really important, and sanctity and purity as well, which is why they have a lot of rules about you know what you can eat, what you can wear, who can sit with whom, etc., etc. But um, these are all the kinds of things that help establish what a, a, a sacred cow would be for people all over the world. Now, let's move from talking about people's visceral responses to a certain subcategory of people, journalists. Like, what is it about them, and what don't they get, okay? And especially, what don't they get about their work, okay? Now, I, you know, this is a generalization, but, you know, I've been working in this field now for about, I don't know, 12 years, so I've met quite a few, and I will say that most of them do not come from science backgrounds. I would say three quarters do not, or more. Very few of them have ever taken college statistics, much less any statistics. I think they don't really know, most journalists don't know anything beyond the word average or mean. Most, I would say. <coughs> they confuse correlation with causation. Um, this is something that, they're not the only ones who do this, but you know, lots of people do this, including scientists but journalists especially because it makes for great headlines and great stories. They confuse descriptive data with normative statements. So this is what happened to me, okay? So when I presented to the Germans Ministry of Women and Family, they thought I was saying, this is how society should look, as opposed to this is how it does look. And actually I was presenting Ian Deary's data, frankly. So I was just saying, this is how it does look, and they heard, this is how it ought to look. And this is what they're going to do to your work if you're not careful to make that distinction and say, this is what is, not what ought to be. So you often have to make that clear. They are under daily deadline pressure. I mean, I have done research, it's not what I do now, and I know what the long kind of trajectory of a research project is like. Now imagine if you had to have results every single day. That is the life of a journalist. You know, in, in daily newspapers, you have a deadline every day. And you have to turn in your copy or you're fired, essentially. So this is something that you need to understand about journalists. If you, for example, want to be quoted and they ask you for an interview, if you don't get back to them in the next 24 hours, your history, because they need to do, they have certain timelines. Magazine journalism is different. There are longer timelines, but nonetheless, this is the kind of a working paper. They have very little job security, so they have to prove themselves. You know, I've heard a lot, you know, over the last few days about um, funding and grants, which for you are the feathers in your caps, but for journalists, scoops are the feathers in their caps and big stories. So if you get a page one story, I mean, that's really good for you. It's like getting a four-year grant. So that's what they're after. They have little time for background research. So don't expect them to know a lot about what you're doing before you talk to them or you answer their questions by email. That's very important. They haven't put in the 10 years that you've put in. They're looking for, or 40 years, when it comes to Ian Deary. <laughs> They're, they're looking for quick, colorful facts and quotes. So what I mean by this is that if you say anything colorful, they're going to use it. Okay? Even if you say, this is off the record, they may use it. And they have very tight word counts, and your quote may get cut from the end. 
So let's say you have a quote, and you say something like, um, I will go to Graz, comma, if the weather is favorable. Okay? So if a journalist who has a tight word count and is over their word count, their editor might just cut off what comes after I will go to Graz. <laughs> Okay? Something, and sometimes what happens is they get cut, without their consent, they get cut from the bottom. So they'll get, you know, they'll put in a story and then everything at the bottom of the story gets cut. I mean, journalists hate that, but this happens in the editing process. Um, so um, this is something that I saw on somebody's door, so I took a picture. I, I think Ian Deary would like it too. You know, most of what we do here, because you cannot really manipulate intelligence, most of the work that we do as intelligence scientists is correlational or longitudinal research. So as you know, it does help. So we can't be too critical of journalists if they make the mistake of confusing it with causes. Now let's go to the other side and look at ourselves. What is it about scientists that, what don't they get? Okay? Um, I, I don't know about, I mean, I'm not really a scientist, but I would just, see this guy here? That was me for many of the presentations at this conference. Now, that can be excused because we're, you know, you're speaking to your peers, but when you're speaking to the press, if this is what's going on in <coughs> the mind of the journalist, they're going to misrepresent your work. It's your responsibility to communicate it clearly, or the article is going to end up being queuing closer to their biases than to what you found. So let's look at what scientists often do, now that we've looked at what journalists often do. Um, they're subject to the curse of knowledge. The curse of knowledge is when you're not aware that what's in your head is not in somebody else's head. Okay? Though, you, know, you forget that the listener doesn't know what you know. Most, those of us who've studied developmental psychology or have children of our own know that there's a stage of egocentrism where they think that what they know is what the other person also knows. Especially, you know, if you're a mother, for sure, you'll, you'll encounter it that, you know, if they've seen something happen, they expect that this knowledge is magically transferred to you. That a, a lot of scientists think this. You know, how long did it take you to become an expert in your field? I mean, I know Malcolm Gladwell has, like, some rule, like, 10,000 hours or something like that. But whatever it was, it took you a very long time to get good and expert in what you do, your journalist, the journalist in front of you or who's on the other side of the world sending you email questions knows nothing about your field as a rule. So it's up to you to explain it. If, oops, wrong button. If you use technical terms, abbreviations, or jargon, you'll lose them. If you neglect to empathize or personalize, um, I think that if you're giving them more room to put their visceral response to your data in as opposed to putting in your story. So for example, you know, it's very important to personalize. This is something that many scientists find difficult. Okay? Um, but if you don't personalize the story, there's nothing for the other person to hang onto and to kind of weave their story around. So at the beginning of this talk, I talked a little, I wasn't going to do this, actually, but I talked a little bit about how Constance Holder and I share some sort of random chance event, and tragically, it was, it was kind of terrible for Constance Holder because it ended her life. I'm sure people are not going to forget that, even though I look different now, I'm not wearing a cast, and I'm not full of bruises and scabs as I was just about a month ago. Okay? But you're going to remember that because it's a story. And the journalist will remember the story that you tell them that makes their, your data come alive. <coughs> and the other thing is, if you forget to acknowledge historical injuries about the data, abuses of knowledge, people here uh, are doing research in intelligence, that kind of research has been abused in the past. And if you don't acknowledge that, then they'll assume that either you don't know or you don't care. And all it takes is just like one little sentence. Okay? Like, we don't want this, you know, knowledge to be used for ill, for example. And I saw Terry do it very masterfully yesterday at the end of her talk. 
I thought she was brilliant at that. Because, of course, they, that, those data that she presented, they presented, can be abused. And they know that. So at the end of the talk, they sort of talked a little bit about, well, what should they do about this? They acknowledged that. And without acknowledging that, it would look worse for them. Now, how do you prepare for an interview? If somebody wants to talk to you, what do you do? What you don't do is squeeze it in between your other responsibilities and just not think about it, okay? Because that's where you get into trouble. Beforehand, what should you do? You should know your audience, okay? Know who you're talking to. How old are they? Are they men or women? You know, are they on the right or the left? Very important. You should refine your message. And when I say refine your message, I mean three to five points maximum. No more than that. Okay, and so as I'm talking to you, you know, sometimes I'll highlight a message that I want to leave you with, and I'll say, this is an important message, and I'm highlighting it, because really I only have three points I'm making today. In longer interviews, let's say you have an hour interview, keep in mind that you have three points that you're making, or five points, and like as if it's a, a little tree, making, they're branching off, the other points you're making are branching off from those main points. Focus on what's new, okay, because journalists essentially, there's a word in journalism called, it has to be fresh. Fresh is the kind of, I don't know, buzzword. So if you found something new that's special, that's what they want to know. Anticipate your triggers. So, you know, what is it that you think is going to get you hot under the collar? Okay, and be prepared for that. So I didn't know when I spoke to that German audience that that would be a trigger for me. Okay, you should figure out what your trigger is and know how you're going to deal with it. Because if you get defensive, believe me, they're going to put that in the story. And the journalist always wins, by the way. <coughs> Review bridging and flagging phrases. Does anybody know what I'm talking about when I talk about bridging and flagging? Anybody here? Put your hand up if, if you know what that means. Okay. Now, bridging and flagging is when and, and <coughs> somebody's talking about something and you'd like to talk about something else. So you have to, you can't do what politicians usually do, which is they just don't answer the question, and they answer a different question. You know, that annoys people, okay? And I, I just want to say that um, this is, uh, I love historical <coughs> pictures, and I put this picture in, um, in honor of uh, David and Camilla, because this is, um, a, a bridge built by federal engineers and it's bridging the Chattanooga River in, in Tennessee. So this one's for you, David and Camilla, who live in Tennessee. And uh, it's 1864. Unfortunately, I'm not as good at PowerPoint as I'd like to be. And there's a, there was a little boy sitting in the corner here, like this, watching what was going on, but I couldn't fit it into the frame. Let's look at bridging and flagging, okay? Say somebody says, you know, something that you agree with but not quite. You know, here's what you say. That's important, but what's really important is then you make a point. One of the three points, right? Yes, but here's what I know. Another one of the three points you want to make, okay? Let's say they ask you something that you don't want to talk about or you know nothing about for example, okay? You can say, I don't know. But what I do know is, okay, and something like that happened to me recently at a writer's festival. I have this new book I have, it's called The Village Effect, and it's about social neuroscience and social epidemiology, but people who haven't read the book often think that I'm extolling, literally extolling village life, which I'm not, it's a metaphor. And I was in front of an audience in Ottawa when, some, when, I think it was the moderator, in fact, said to me something like, well, you know, the native population in Canada, they all live in villages. And you know their health outcomes are really poor. So can you explain what's going on in the native communities in Canada? Now, I just will tell you one thing, since I don't think I'm not that many Canadians. This is a hot topic in Canada. 
native, that it's politically a huge hot potato, and it's very, very complex. And so at that point I said, I don't know much about that, I said, but when I use the word village, I need it as a metaphor, not a literal village. And then I said, but what I can say is, and then I made one of my points, okay? And it's very important not to get drawn in by something that is not in your area of expertise. If they're talking about something that you don't really know much about or you don't want to emphasize or they're taking you in a different direction, bring it back to your three points or your five points. Or you can say, to personalize it, the question I get most often is, whatever it is. I mean, but you choose it, right? What that question is. Here is where you personalize it again. What concerns me most about this area is, and here's where, for example, if you're going to acknowledge historical abuses of the kind of information you're researching, you can say, what concerns me most is that my data may be misused by people on the right. You can say whatever you want here, but it's a useful phrase to have. Now, what about during the interview? What should you do during the interview? Remember, you're not walking into the interview cold, right? Okay. Now, the first thing is remember, you are in charge, not them. Okay. You have to lead the conversation. So, uh, think about that using your bridging and flagging phrases. Don't let them pull you around by the nose, because they'll dry up, right? The second is. Make it a story. Personalize it. Make it a story that they can remember. And the, this is a New Yorker cartoon, and I'll read you the tagline because it's very small. It says, these are two little boys who've clearly gotten into trouble. It says, okay, let's get our stories straight and our characters sympathetic and well-drawn. <laughs> One of the characters is you, by the way. Okay? Clarify your message. You don't want the journalists to look like that. Okay, you think you're doing this, but really what they're getting is this. Okay? And reframe or change the direction of the interview. That, re that relates to the first point I made. Okay? So let's see if I can get this video to play. This is a, a, a little short clip from the Today Show, and the reason why I'm showing it to you is because um, this person who's interviewed got into a lot of hot water about a book she wrote. She's since written another book that's also controversial. And she got into such hot water, I know because I had a coffee with her just about six weeks ago, that uh, she's a professor of law at Yale. And I know that they got into such hot water, they had to hire somebody to teach them how to deal with the press. Now, she's being interviewed about her first book, which is called Battle Hymn of the Tiger Mother. And this is Amy Chua, and she wrote a book about parenting in which it was actually a sarcastic memoir. But people took it literally, just the way they take my book, The uh, Village Effect, that the village is literal. And she was raped over the coals on this because she essentially described her very strict Asian, the way she brought up her kids in a very strict traditional Asian way. She didn't let them go on play dates. She didn't let them have sleepovers. They had to take two instruments. They had to be at the top of their class. Everything they, everything they did had to meet a very high standard. Now, she was writing a send up a little bit of herself, but the journalists took it literally, and the blogosphere just lit up. So I'm going to ask you to watch what happens when she's interviewed on the Today Show, which has a huge audience in the United States and how masterfully she changes the direction of the interview. Now, let's see, I can't, let's see. I can get it to start here. That's one of the most. Uh-oh, don't tell me we're going to have the, let's see. Okay. Controversial figures of 2011 was not a politician or a celebrity, but a mom. Amy Chua ignited a firestorm by sharing the surprising details of her strict parenting methods in the book Battle Him of the Tiger Mother. Well, now it's out in paperback. Amy, good morning to you. Good morning. Thanks for having me. And you've been pounded with criticism in the one year since this book was released, uh, in which you described, as I just mentioned, this sort of these extreme methods of parenting. 
um, in which some people might say you actually berated your children into excelling. If you had to do it over again, would you write the same book? I think I would. You know, I, I'm, I'm, the book is a memoir, and you know, I made a lot of mistakes. I have some regrets, but if I had to do it all over again, I would raise my kids the same way. In other words, I'm a proud, strict mom. I'm incredibly proud of the girls that I raised. And you know, you say extreme parenting, but it's interesting. If you think about it, this kind of tiger parenting is not that different from the traditional parenting of America's founders and pioneers. I don't think it's really about berating or the violin. I think it's about assuming strength rather than weakness in our children and basically helping them be you know, the best that they can be. That said, uh, how bad did it get? Because you said, I think so. So obviously it was very rough on The first two months were pretty terrible. Um, the internet is scary. Uh, you know, just there's so much stuff out there. Okay. Did you see how she, let me just get it from the did you see how she changed the direction? Because she said one thing and the journalist said, but you said, and she changed it, it's starting to pass a little bit. She changed it by saying, this isn't a story about, you know, being a strict parent. This is, I'm just being the kind of parent, I'm just telling them to assume strength, not weakness, like America's founding fathers. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, who had to agree with that? <laughs> right? And actually, I will say that I'm reading the next book, I'm almost through it, which I actually wanted a clip of her talking about the new book, because the new book is called The Triple Package. It's out in paperbacks, so it's not that new. And she looks at the cultural values in different ethnic and racial groups that promote success. Okay? So she's not dealing with genetic kind of factors, but what is it about not just Asian families, but Jewish families, Iranian families, the original Cuban immigrants that made their children a success in America, especially in the classroom. So she's sort of getting close to some of the areas that you guys work on. Um, she never really, they don't, they never really talk about intelligence, but they, she and her husband who wrote it together talk a lot about intelligence. So, <coughs> During the interview, to summarize, I don't know why it's buzzing. Do you guys hear a buzz? Yes. Where's Where's Yevin? Are you good? <laughs> Thank you, Yevin. <laughs> Lead the dance, so you can change the direction of the interview, just like Amy Schwa changed the direction. I mean, if she wasn't prepared, and if she let the journalist say, "But you said I think so." and then hammer her, she was ready for that, okay? And said, you know, it's not me, it's the internet. What can I do? The internet is a terrible place. <laughs> Oops, I don't want to get it up. Bring yourself into the story. Don't be afraid to reveal yourself as a human being who has feelings, okay? Because the journalist will sympathize more with you that way, okay? Clarify and tighten your message. Stop when it's punchy. Okay? Then the journalist will quote you where you want to be quoted. Okay? Never ever comment off the record. Okay? What you're saying confidentially to the journalist, it's not confidential. <laughs> and avoid pitfalls through bridging, flagging, and reframing. And may I add, by knowing your particular triggers. So let's get back now, I'm nearing the end of the lecture, and I would like to get back to Constance Holder, because she was a superb journalist, and she was not afraid of controversy. And she wrote a great story called Peering Under the Hood of African Runners in Science. And there's a picture of Kip Kino, this is a Kenyan runner um, and a long distance runner. And the question she was asking in her story, and she interviewed the scientists about this, is why is it that East Africans are the best long distance runners in the world, and West Africans, or those who have West African roots, are the best sprinters in the world? Okay? So she had to talk about the genetics of race. And she did it masterfully. 
She did it beautifully, but I will say that a journalist who was not as accomplished as she would would never even go near this story because some people will think of this. And this says this is a policeman and there's a, there's a, a black youth running and he says, stop and I'll shoot. Okay? Now, I wasn't even going to show this cartoon because it's so offensive. And in fact, I got it out of a collection of New Yorker cartoons that they found too offensive to print. Okay, but this is what people are thinking when you're talking about the genetics of race. I mean, you didn't hear much about this in the last few days, but I have heard that that has sometimes been brought up at this meeting, am I right? So you have to be very careful. You want them to not think of this, but think of this, okay? And to do that, you have to be in charge of what you tell them. So as a conclusion, be aware and sensitive to people's moral triggers, including your own. Prepare for the press as you would for a job talk. Okay? Most of you would take a job talk pretty seriously, right? This could be pretty serious for your career. If you give an interview um, and you don't know how to handle the press and your data are hot, that could end your career. Okay? And remember, the rider on the elephant. Okay? The rider on the elephant is the person who's trying to master their emotional response or their intuitions about moral situations. That's the person you're talking to. And don't just think about the elephant in the room. The data. Thank you. There's actually quite a useful way of dealing with this, which appeals to this issue of fairness. And that is to, to in addition to acknowledge the abuses, to, to put in a, 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 a statement to the effect that the opposite has also been abused. The blank slate ideology has also been abused by various ideologues, Pol Pot, um, Mao Zedong, Lenin, Stalin, etc. And then you, you create a sense of fairness. You say, well, it's not all black and white. It's not like we're totally to blame for all the evils in the world. There are other people who take the opposite extreme, and they've actually uh, they, they've actually done a lot of harm themselves. And all of a sudden, you get this this sort of acknowledgement. I found this in actual direct experience with journalists. So they go, "Oh yeah, that's a good point." Okay, and it kind of appeals to the, this balance issue that you brought up at the beginning. And you've changed the direction. Okay, yeah. you, 
by doing that, you're doing what Amy Chua did, where she said, actually, this is the same thing as the founding fathers tried to achieve. She's just, you're just moving the conversation over. And I think that's a great idea. Yes? Well, I've had a lot of experiences with the press, too, as you know, well know, and I resonate to what you say. And um, one thing that I think is very helpful is if you can find, and I would have added to your list, is before you discuss it, if you can find some common ground that you can agree on before you start disagreeing. It really helps to have a common ground or, as I say, to be able to throw them a bone and to, you know, to give them something that they care about. So this is at least my view. I think everything you suggested was very good. But if we can find common ground, then it's a lot easier to discuss where we all have the differences. So I, I like your tactics, but that would be another tactic that I would add to the list. It, it's a great tactic. And I don't know if you mean common ground intellectually in what you're going to talk about, or common ground in life. You, you, I would think it has to relate to the topic, but there's something you can agree on. Like if you could talk about the women, we all, you know, of course both of us want women to be able to advance. Yes, we do, you know, and then it's sort of a, I lower the temperature just a little bit because they feel, I know with my own data, that, or our own data, that they feel that we're anti-women. And, and I can say, well, you know, of course I'm not anti-women. I, you know, I wouldn't be here. <laughs> you, by doing that, you're essentially acknowledging the historical abuses. You are, but you're also saying we share this value. That's it. I would say that there is one thing that I've, has happened to me, which is that journalists will often spend time to try to get to know you a little bit before the interview starts in earnest. And I've been burned by that, where you think that, well, you have all this common ground, and they understand you, and you're just, say, for example, two career women with families, and you're on the same page. And then, there's like a little delay while they write their story, and then they slam you. Because <clears throat> it's part of their tactic to relax you and loosen your tongue by getting to know you. And you know, and this happened to me once. At, luckily, it wasn't a very big venue. It was something I think like, I think it was the McGill Alumnus Magazine or something. So it wasn't huge, but the journalist spent 20 minutes on the phone saying like this really resonates with me because um, you know I have a child with attention deficit disorder and a learning disability and what you write in your book about fragile extreme males really resonates with me and she talked for about 15 minutes about her son and about clinicians in the area where we both live and then she wrote one of the most hostile pieces I've ever seen. <laughs> so I, what happened to me, one of the mistakes that I had made was I thought she was friendly, right? And, and here we had all this common ground. I think what you're saying is wiser because you're sort of getting something out of the way right at the beginning, which is we all want women to advance. We're all, I'm very concerned about discrimination against women. I think that's immoral, okay? But that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying, what I found is, and then you can talk about it. So I think that's a great idea. So let's go back to uh, your experience with the German audience. They are now standing and applauding, and you're thinking, oh my god. The applause stops and they sit down. What did you say? Well, did you, do you want to know the truth or what I really wanted to happen? <laughs> let's have both starting with the truth. <laughs> OK, <clears throat> so what did happen is that there wasn't really a question in there. It was kind of one of those long declar declarative kind of things. And what I tried to say was that actually, you know, I want to try to say two things. Actually, science has a set of rules that you have to follow no matter what country you're in or whether you're male, female, or what you are, everybody has to follow the same rules and they're international. And I said, and as it happens, most science in this area, psychology, education, and behavioral science, is done by women. Okay? 
That's what I tried to say at the mic. And I should have had the advantage because I had the mic. But there were 500 people in the audience. And they went on clapping for so long that they didn't hear that. Mm -hmm. That is what happened. It was like one of those extended standing ovations like for Rostropovich or something. <laughs> and it was probably, you know, it was, it, it, you know, if you want to look at the silver lining, it was like, you know, I <coughs> got off the podium and I thought, how am I going to avoid this next time? But I, I thought it was horrible because I realized then that they had brought me to Germany as a straw man. Okay, and I didn't know that in advance, but I should have known that in advance. And then I was much wiser about the speaking engagements that I accepted. Usually, I should have known, but I didn't know because they invited me to be a keynote speaker and then about five days before the event, they said, and on the stage, we're gonna put this academic, who I knew, who had the opposite point of view, and you guys are going to have a debate. Okay, so I said, no, I didn't agree to a debate. I agreed to a keynote address, and if it's not a keynote address, I'm not coming. But that should have sort of, I should have had some bells ringing at that point. Um, so it was, it was a very interesting experience. I will never forget it. <laughs> okay, and had I known that a little bit more about my audience, for example, I would have owned up on my critical theory a little bit, so I could have a proper rebuttal. But what's your rebuttal to that lady now? She, uh, we've had 10 minutes of applause, they're all in tears, the German flag, and then Rich is in the audience, he says, go for it, go for it. And what's the answer? But you know, there's, that's too, my answer would be too long for what I have now, but essentially most of us know what the answer is, right? But you have to sort of know where they're coming from to give them the appropriate response. And if you don't know your audience, they're going to surprise you, as they surprised me. So, are there any, is there any other questions? Yeah. What, what did happen when, when they finally stopped applauding? Oh, then there were other questions. But I realized at that point, which I didn't know, was that it was a hostile audience to these ideas. Yeah, so how did you get out of there? I mean, I just answered the questions and, and, and carried on. But the other thing is that if you... I mean, I'm not going to out. No, no, no. And you're also, I mean, you probably don't know. Here we have a mic here, but when you're talking to a large audience, you usually have a lavalier mic that's mic'd on the inside of your clothes. Okay? So it means, like, you can't go anywhere. <laughs> you're, you're, like, you've got a wire going up the back of your dress, so you're trapped. <laughs> so yeah, I mean it was it was an important experience for me and afterwards when I came back I spoke to some friends who are academics about it and they said, Yeah, of course. I mean, this is the debate that's going on in the academy. Every university, pretty much every person in humanities thinks that science is a social construction. Okay, and I naively at that point was still thinking, well, you know, science is science, you know. Yeah. yeah. I only want to make one short comment. It was in the past history of ideas, it was usual that intellectuals has had problems with audiences or with other people in their time. For example, Jean-Jacques Rousseau or Voltaire and so on. And in, if, if you have a good idea, you have to live with this problem, you know? <laughs> if not, then you have to become bakers or, or uh, I don't know what, what other, other jobs, you know. It's one of our tasks we have to deal with. Right, and I, I would add to that that I know in science you're very, very busy and there are a lot of demands on your time. So that's why I think people often walk into interviews unprepared. Right? They'll just sort of say, and I know because I'm on the other side as a journalist and you know, often people will give me an interview on the train from their cell phone. And I'm thinking like, I have the advantage here. Right? But because I sort of, I'm pro-science and I'm pro-empirical data, you know, I don't use it, misuse it that way. But another journalist could misuse it. Maybe this guy's sitting in a departure lounge or sitting on the train and he's actually trying to finish the discussion section of his article and you're just like this minor little distraction. But they can use that against you. One last question maybe? Sure. Uh, this one at the back. Yes. Yeah. So you, you said the, the journalist always wins. Um, but but what, what's your advice if someone does write a 
you know, a hatchet job piece that misrepresents the, the, the science. Do you know what the kind of success rate is for getting corrections in newspapers and things? Or, or what advice would you have to, to someone who's really been misrepresented in the press? Well, I think if they've got their facts wrong, you have to correct that. Okay? that but I think that if you write a piece disagreeing with the slant of their story, okay, and you write back, then you run the risk of looking petulant and defensive. So it, it, it varies by situation, really. Um, but certainly if they somehow twist what you said to them into something it's not, then you have to correct the record, for sure. All right, so we should bring the session to an end, but hopefully Susan will be around in a break to maybe have further conversation with people. Sure, and sure. And uh, I think if you welcome me for thinking, Susan, once again, for inspiration. Yeah. Or